All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm assuming most of you are watching because you're registered in the Physics 111 course. Um, and so we certainly find ourselves in a unique situation where we've done two thirds of the term via a regular face to face lecture. And now we're suddenly faced with the prospect of trying to do online lectures. Um, so I'm going to make my best effort to try to present things in a reasonable way and to cover the same material that we would have covered in the regular class. I hope you'll be patient with me as I try to figure out something that's going to work well and is manageable. Uh, feel free to leave comments uh, below the video. Uh, you can either say things that you think might improve the videos, some suggestions for improvements, and I will try to implement those as long as they're they're reasonable. Um, and if there's something you like, you can leave that comment and leave some encouragement as well. So uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to just encourage you all to keep an eye on the course website. And so let me jot down the URL. And you can check the website, so people.oak.ubc.ca slash J Babowsk without an I, and then it should be Fizz 121.html. And so if there's any updates on how the course is going to run, uh, what the evolving situation is, then that's going to be posted on the course website. And so I'd like to restrict these videos to really being on the lecture content. And so I'll do that the best I can. Uh, and so let's make the best of it. There, there are certainly are going to be some actual advantages. One of them is that of course, you can watch these videos whenever it's most convenient for you, so you're not restricted to just the, the scheduled lecture time. Another advantage is you can go back and rewatch part of a video if you want to. Um, and then, of course, maybe the biggest advantage is my left hand won't be covering up the notes that I just jotted down. So let's try and get started. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the first few sections of chapter uh, 29 in the night textbook. So up to this point, what we've been focused on is talking about charge and electric fields and more recently, uh, simple circuits. The last two chapters that we're going to talk about in the course are have to do with magnetism. And so today, what we hope to do is maybe to talk about some of the basic facts about magnetism, probably a lot of the things that you already know. And what we'll do is we'll try to make some comparisons to charge and electricity and see what are the similarities and then point out what some of the differences are. So the first type of naturally occurring magnetic material that was covered and has been studied for a long time and is still studied today was originally called lodestone. And so this is a material that I said, like I said, occurs naturally. Its um, chemical formula is Fe3O4. So it's an oxide of iron. And the more common name these days is magnetite. And so this is something that you can find or you can just go purchase on eBay or wherever. And um, so I want to imagine that what you had is two pieces of magnetite that were shaped like a rod. And so if we had these two rod like pieces of magnetite, what we would find is that in one configuration, if we take the rods and put them end to end, that the two ends might attract one another. And so if I took 
one piece of magnetite, say I leave the top one the same, and then the other one, I flip it over. Okay, and so maybe we color the ends. So one end was red and another end was blue. So when I flip it, the blue end sides over here and then the red sides over here. If initially the two rods attracted to each other, then after I flip one of them, then there's gonna be a repulsion between these rods. And in some sense, that's a lot like what we already have seen for charges. We've seen that if we have charges, uh, like charges, repel one another. So two positives repel, two negatives repel, but opposite charges attract a positive charge is attracted to a negative charge. And so a similar thing is happening here where we've got kind of a distinction between the two ends of these magnetite rods or these magnetic rods. Um, if we were going to compare these two rods, what we would say is when they were oriented so that they attracted one another, what we had is kind of this distinction between the two rods, red, blue, and then red, blue, so that the two opposites the two sides that were different from one another were closest and they attract. Of course, when we flipped the bottom rod and left the top rod in its original orientation, what we end up with is the two like ends nearby one another. And in that case, we get a repulsion. And so, as I'm sure you know, magnets are usually associated given names of north and south for their two poles. So in the first configuration, we had the south pole of the top rod closest to the north pole of the bottom rod and they attract. In the other situation, the top rod was left unchanged, but the bottom one was flipped. And so what we had in this case is the two south sides of the rods next to one another. And we had this repulsion. Um, we could have done the other thing. We could have taken our top rod and flipped it. And then let's suppose we take our bottom rod and we flip it again. So that now what we would have is the south pole of the top rod at the top and the south pole of the bottom rod at the bottom and then the north poles close to each other. So blue is north and red is south. And what happens is we would again, we would see this repulsion. And so the conclusion of this is that opposite poles attract Opposite poles attract and like poles repel. Okay, and so, like I said, that's very much like what we saw for charges. Um, now, let's suppose that we could, for a moment, have a particle that had just a magnetic charge of north, for example. So we had a single particle, and let's say we give that particle a magnetic charge of north. So this is a isolated particle with a magnetic charge of north. If we could do that, then what we could do is we could say, well, that charged particle produces a magnetic field. And for the north charge, 
the magnetic field is going to emanate out from that charge. And so we would have this point charge that would produce, instead of an electric field for a positive charge, it would produce a magnetic field. And for a point particle, that magnetic field would have a magnitude that would be proportional to 1 over r squared, just like for electric charges. If I had an isolated particle with a magnetic charge of south, then it would produce a magnetic field that would be exactly the same magnitude as the north charge. It would just have the opposite orientation. And if I had two isolated magnetic charges, they would attract one another. And the force of attraction would be given something like Coulomb's law. So the force between our magnetic charges would be proportional to, say, let's say QB1, uh, maybe let's say QM1. So this is our magnetic charge. Oh, sorry. I'll get used to this. This is the magnetic charge 1, and this is the magnetic charge of particle 2, and it would be proportional to the product of those charges uh, divided by the square of the distance between them. And if we could do all these things, then we could repeat everything we did for electric charges. We could, for example, uh, make a capacitor that we place some uh, north charge on one plate and a south charge on the other plate. And if we did that, if that was possible, then we'd have, say, a bunch of north on one of our plates, and we'd have a bunch of south magnetic charge on the other plate, and we would get a uniform magnetic field between our plates and we could store magnetic energy in our magnetic capacitor just like we store electric energy in a electrically charged capacitor. Uh, other things we could do is we might be able to if we had materials that had isolated magnetic charges that were free to move like magnetic conductors or something like that then you could make magnetic circuits and that would all be very interesting and fun and neat. Um, however, let's talk about some of the differences now that you see between magnetic uh, materials and, say, electric charges. We started by talking about a, a chunk of magnetite, and so we, we imagine that we had this magnetite rod, and we gave one end a north pole and one end a south pole. Okay, so let's suppose we were to take this and we cut our magnetic rod in half so that maybe this might be one way to produce an isolated magnetic north and magnetic south charge. Okay, so we cut the thing in half And, you know, this is, of course, possible to do. And what we find is we don't get isolated north and south poles. We now get two magnets. And each of them has their own north and south pole. The magnet that's been cut in two pieces, each of the pieces has a magnetism, an ability to attract say a piece of iron that's a little bit weaker now but nonetheless it's still an isolated magnet each of them having north and south poles and then of course what we could try to do is we could try okay say well what if we just cut this again and you can imagine what's going to happen is we're going to end up with these four little pieces and they're all going to have their own north and south poles. Again, these four little pieces are going to be their own magnets. They're all going to be a little bit weaker, 
than the original and then also weaker than the pair that we had from the first cut. Nonetheless, we still have north and south poles for all of them. And we could continue, we could keep cutting these smaller and smaller and smaller, and we could even get down to microscopic sizes of this magnetite rod, and we would never find that we could have a piece of magnetite or a piece of any magnetic material that has just a north or just a south magnetic charge. It always comes as a north-south pair. So people have searched for a long time and as of right now there's been no experimental discovery of an isolated magnetic charge. So north and south poles always come in pairs. There has not been any observation of an isolated north or south magnetic charge. So that's one difference. Um, we did we did encounter a similar situation for charges where we could have uh, a separation of positive and negative charge. One example is the water molecule, where we have a oxygen and two hydrogen. So this is O and H and H, and the O has a charge of minus two, and each hydrogen has a charge of plus one. And so in some sense, what you have is a separation of the negative and the positive, just like we had a separation of the north and south uh, poles of our magnetic rod. And so this we call the dipole. So the water molecule is an electric dipole and our bar magnet is a magnetic dipole. So red is south and blue is north. So this is a magnetic dipole. Okay, but we know some properties about the electric dipole. Um, I don't want to get quantitative about it, but let's just remind ourselves of, for example, what the configuration of the electric field was. So if we had an electric dipole, what we could do is we could say, all right, we have a plus and a minus, and we know that electric field lines emanate from positive charges and they end on negative charges. So if we were to draw the electric field of a dipole, it would look something like this. Okay, well, in exactly the same way, the bar magnet behaves as a magnetic dipole, so here's north and south, and it produces a magnetic field, so here this one's the electric field, a magnetic field emanates from the north pole, and, and so here's some 
magnetic field lines. And so these are B fields. Now, because we can't have isolated north and south poles, you never get a situation where a magnetic field doesn't loop back on itself. So for example, we were talking about a charged capacitor, so we could have one plate charged negative, one plate charged positive, and in a capacitor, we're gonna get electric fields that go from the positive to the negative. Sorry. It's not possible to do this kind of thing with our magnetic materials because I can't separate the north poles and place them on one surface and then place only south poles on the second surface. And so what happens is that magnetic field lines, magnetic field lines always form closed loops. Okay, uh, so let's think about some other things that we might be able to do with these bar magnets. Let's imagine that we take a really tiny bar magnet. So we take our piece of magnetite or whatever the magnetic material we want is, and we shave off a very thin, very fine piece. So it's very light and we suspend it in water so that it can rotate freely without, uh, without much friction. That's essentially, that's a compass, right? So we can make a compass, uh, compass, is a fine uh, bar magnet. So it has a north and south pole uh, suspended in in a low friction, say liquid of some sort. So it's free to rotate. So I'm going to draw my compass in this kind of, well, I can draw a better one. So one end is going to be north and one end is going to be south. And this thing is free to rotate about, say, an axis through its center. And of course, what you know is you can go buy this compass anywhere at Canadian Tire and you go out into the road. And what happens is the compass rotates until the north pole points to geographic north. So compass, needle, rotates such that its north pole points to geographic north. So if you're here in Kelowna and you buy a compass, the needle points towards Vernon. Okay, so that's kind of interesting because we know that the north pole of a magnet is attracted to the south pole of another magnet. And so if we think of Earth then, And so here's, here's Earth, right? And Earth has a magnetic field. And so what we could imagine is that inside Earth, there's some kind of bar magnet. And 
so here we are sitting over here and we've got our own we've got our own little compass and that compass rotates to point to geographic north and so here's our compass and then the needle, the north pole and the needle points to geographic north. But that's attracted to south poles of a magnet. And the south pole of our compass is attracted to north poles of the Earth's magnetic field. And so it's this kind of funny situation where geographic north corresponds to the magnetic south pole of the Earth's magnetic field. So it's just kind of a, an interesting thing to it's slightly non-intuitive so geographic north corresponds to magnetic south pole of earth's magnetic field Okay, so those are some, some just some basic properties of magnetic materials that you can just find. Uh, these days, it's very easy to buy very strong magnetics, uh, permanent magnets. Um, so they're called uh, neodymium magnets, are the common ones that are very strong. Uh, so you can order these online from a bunch of different vendors, and uh, they're they're quite, it's something you wouldn't want to swallow because if you got close to a big chunk of iron, that, that magnet might be strong enough to do some damage to your internal organs, for example. Okay. So in fact, what we're going to be most interested in is not the interaction of a magnetic material with another magnetic material. What we're in fact going to be primarily focused on is the interaction between uh, charges and magnetism. And so to see how that's going to work, I again, I just want to start with a qualitative discussion that might shed some light on how the interaction between electricity and magnetism works. So, interaction between charge and magnetic fields. So I want to imagine a simple experiment. What we're going to do is we're just going to take a wire. So this is a a good conductor, something like uh, copper. So we have a copper wire, and we're going to start with no current in our copper wire, and let's also say the charge on our wire is zero. So it's, uh, it's neutral. There's just as much negative charge on the wire as there is positive charge. Okay, and then what we do is we're going to place a compass next to this wire and so the arrow on my compass corresponds to the north pole of the compass needle and so let's say I'll make it a bit bigger and what we find is that the compass needle just points to geographic north compass needle points to geographic north. In other words, the presence of the wire with no current and no excess charge does nothing to the compass needle. It would have pointed to north whether the wire was there or not. Okay, so next what we'll do is we'll take our wire 
and I'm still going to set the current to be zero. But this time, maybe we place some positive charge on our wire. So we'll say Q is not zero. And we'll do the same experiment. We take our compass, we put it next to the wire, and we let it rotate to whatever orientation it wants. And what we find is, again, nothing happens. Compass points to geographic north. OK, so so far, that's not very interesting. Um, so the next thing we'll do is we'll do the same experiment. But what we'll do is this time we'll say that there's some current through our wire. And the next thing we do is we say, OK, let's put a, so, oops, sorry. I'm going to try to, oh, let's, let me see if I can get back to where I want it to be here. OK, so I'm going to try to represent like a, this is a plane that's perpendicular to the wire. And I'm going to place my compass in that plane. And this time, what we find is that the orientation of the needle changes. And if I placed one over here, it would have a different orientation than the compass on the left-hand side. And if I place one behind the wire, it also has a different orientation. And if I place one in front, And it looks like wherever I place this compass, the needle points in a direction that kind of encircles the wire. And of course, the only thing that can cause the compass needle to rotate is a magnetic field. And so it's as if or it appears like the current in the wire is creating a magnetic field. As soon as I turn the current off, if I set the current to zero, all those needles, all four of them, would just reorient to point to geographic north. And then when I turn the current back on, they will go back into the orientation that I've drawn here. And so, a non-zero current causes the compass needles to change their orientation. The current does this by establishing a magnetic field in the vicinity of the wire. So this happens because the current in the wire establishes a magnetic field. Around the wire. Okay, and so could we could we imagine what the direction of that magnetic field must be? Um, let's just remind ourselves about the compass needle. 
the compass needle is going to point. So if this is the north and this is the south, this would point in a direction that would, so if we had a south pole over here and a north pole over here, then this north pole and that south pole would create a magnetic field that points from north to south. And so our compass needle is going to point the arrow of my compass needle over here in the drawings around the wire represents the North Pole. And so the North Pole points in the direction of the magnetic field. And so if we go back to this picture, what must be happening is we must have a magnetic field that is encircling our wire in that direction. So there's a, there's a handy little rule that you can follow for determining the direction of the magnetic field that is created by the current in a wire. And it's called the right-hand rule. We'll actually encounter a couple of different right-hand rules. And so what I'd like to tell you is right-hand rule number one. So right hand rule number one. So to determine the direction of a magnetic field B, due to a current in a wire, do the following. So step one is to point the thumb of your right hand in the direction of the current. So in our example up here, our current is towards the top of the screen. So you would take your right hand, and it's important that it's your right hand, and you would point your thumb in the direction of that current. And then what happens is your fingers naturally curl in the direction of the magnetic field. The fingers of your right hand curl in the direction of B. So this is something in a face-to-face -face class. I could just show you with my right hand how to do this, and I could ask you all to do that same thing. Um, so here we're faced with our first challenge. I'm going to try to draw this and it's really going to test my ability to draw. So this is your thumb. And then what happens is your fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. And so if this is the current direction, then the magnetic field is curling around the current in the direction of your fingers. Okay, so that's the first right hand rule. What you could do is you could take compasses and you could try to probe the strength of the magnetic field at different distances away from the wire. And so how could you do that? You could try to, uh, for example, push the compass needle 
out of the direction that it wants to be and you could measure how hard you had to push the needle to change its orientation. And what you would find is that very close to the wire, you'd have to push harder on the needle to get it to move out of the direction of the magnetic field. When you moved further away from the wire, then you could change the needle's orientation which with less force, okay? And so that's telling you that the magnetic field created by this current gets weaker as you move away from the wire. Okay, so we can use the compass needle to probe the strength of the magnetic field as a function of distance from the wire. we would find that B gets weaker, uh, weaker as we move further away from the wire. Okay, so um, what I'd like to try to do is I'd like to try to draw a current carrying wire um, from an end view. So this is going to be an end view. Oh. End view of a current carrying wire. So what does the end of a wire look like? It just looks like a, a little circle. And so this wire is extending out of the page and extending into the page as well. So what we need to do is we need to have a way to indicate the direction of the current. And so what we're going to do for the remainder of the course is we're going to use an X to indicate indicates a current into the page. And so this X, one, one common way to think of this is if you shoot an arrow away from yourself, you see the feathers of the arrow. And so this cross is the feathers of the arrow flying away from you. If we were to draw a circle with just a point, then that's like the tip of the arrow coming towards you. And so this indicates a current out of the page. Okay, so let's draw, let's imagine that we have a current that's going into the page in this case. Okay, so if we did the right hand rule, what we would do is we would put our thumb in the direction of the current. So I'd point my thumb uh, as if it's going into the screen in the direction of the current and I would figure out which way do my thumbs, uh, my fingers naturally curl. And we would find that our fingers tend to curl uh, clockwise around this wire. And so I'm going to draw these clockwise circles, sorry. 
going around our wire. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to plot what the strength of the magnetic field might look like. So close to the wire, we're going to have a strong magnetic field. So I'm going to have these relatively long magnetic field lines. And as long as I stay the same distance away from my wire, the strength of the field doesn't change. Uh, but its direction is always changing, right, by the right-hand rule. And then if I move out to a further distance, what we find is that the direction is the same, but the fields are weaker now. And so I have these shorter magnetic field lines. And then if I move really far away, the field gets even weaker. And so we have these short little magnetic field lines now. Okay, and so that's a qualitative picture of how the magnetic field looks and how it changes around a current carrying wire. So maybe in the last few minutes here, what we'll do is we'll just try to see if we can write down something a little more quantitative. Um, and so the, the topic is the Biot-Zavart law. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay between what I write and when it appears on the screen. Biot-Savart law. And so what this law is going to tell us is the strength of the magnetic field due to a moving charge. So we've, we've seen here from experimental observation that a current creates a magnetic field which will exert a force on our compass needles. Um, but what is current? Current is a moving charge. So current, which is moving charge, creates a magnetic field. What the Biot Savart law is going to do is it's going to tell us uh, what the strength of that field is. So the Biot Savart law tells us the strength. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've lost my ability to write here. Okay, so this thing's frozen on me, so maybe what I'll do is I'll stop here and we'll pick this up next time. All right, so let's see how well this has worked. All right, bye-bye.